Hey everyone, Dr. Hanisha here. Thank you so much for joining me on my podcast, Mahan Health with Dr. Hanisha. Mahan literally translates to great in Sanskrit and it only makes sense to have the absolute best when it comes to your health. My goal is by you listening or watching this podcast, you're getting just a little bit closer to achieving Mahan or great health yourself. This podcast is all for you, so please make sure to comment what you'd like to learn more about so I can get a guest on the show who's an expert in that field or I might even talk about it myself. I do see patients and clients all over the world virtually, so make sure to book your free 15-minute phone call today to see how you can start achieving Mahan or great health yourself. Also, I am very excited because I am working with the Berkey Water Filter Company now. I absolutely love my Berkey. It filters over 200 contaminants, including a number of heavy metal toxins that are often found in our water that can affect our gut health, hormone health, brain health, mental health, and so much more. It also has a fluoride filter, which you do do have to get separately, but it's definitely worth it. If you use my code Dr. Hanisha, you can get 5% off on your order, which may not seem like much at first, but it definitely helps with such an amazing filter to drink and bathe in. We should all be drinking at least 80 ounces of water a day and most of us shower daily, so it's absolutely crucial to make sure that we have the highest quality water. I will have the information uh, on the code in the show notes, so make sure to check that out. All right, let's talk about the episode for today. Today's episode, we're talking about homeopathy. So this is a super controversial um, topic because so many people just don't understand how it works. Most people think it's placebo, uh, but it has worked for so many people, including myself. And quite frankly, I really don't care how it works as long as it does. But we do talk about the ways that it works in this episode with Dr. Nazanin Vasigi. She's amazing. And in this episode, I do share my own story with homeopathy. uh, Sorry, homeopathy. And so make sure to get a good listen and try it out for yourself or ask your naturopathic doctor if homeopathy could be right for you. All right. So here's a little about a little bit more information about Dr. Vasigi before we get to the interview. Uh, Dr. Nazanin Vasigi is a naturopathic doctor and associate professor of homeopathy at Bastyr University, California. Dr. Vasigi graduated from Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine in Arizona. After completing a general medicine residency at SCNM, she was accepted into a specialized homeopathy residency sponsored by Standard Homeopathic under Stephen Messer, oh, sorry, Dr. Stephen Messer. She is an established speaker, having spoken at the AMP and the other national conferences, and her work has been published in the, uh, in the NDNR and Homeopathy Today. In addition to teaching homeopathy at BUC, she serves as faculty supervisor at BC Clinic, training naturopathic medical students in clinical homeop- homeopathy. She was my professor, and I absolutely love her. She is the one who convinced me that homeopathy works because her story is absolutely so fascinating itself. So make sure you check, um, make sure you listen to that. But in general, just all the things that I've learned from her uh, has helped me realize how homeopathy can help so many people. And I've had quite a few patients, especially my patients with like mental health conditions, like anxiety or depression report significant improvements with homeopathy. So um, so I'm really excited to share this episode, even though it's super controversial, I don't really care because um, if it works, it works. And that's all that really matters to me. So uh, make sure to rate and review this podcast and let us know what you thought of this episode and reach out to Dr. Vasigi or myself after the show. All right, enjoy. Hi, Dr. Vasigi, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, how are you, Dr. Patel? I am doing so well. It's so good to have you. Um, I have already, I've already told my listeners, but like uh, you were one of my favorite professors. So I'm so grateful to have you here. um, One of my mentors um, on the show. Thank you so much. And can I just say, it's so cool to call you Dr. Patel (laughs) for having you as one of my students. So, so, so happy to be here with you today. Yeah, me too. Okay. So tell us, Um, Let's get into it. Tell us about your journey. How did you get involved in naturopathic medicine? Great, great question. So, um, you know, I was always really interested in the human body when I was really young. And my parents always tell me that I wanted to be a doctor from a really young age because 
I was concerned who was going to take care of them when they got older. And so as I went through school, uh, I essentially, you know, was very pre-med, was really into science, molecular biology. And um, during the time when I was in high school, my mom was having a number of, of health issues that I saw her go from doctor to doctor to doctor, and she wasn't getting a lot of results from it. And that really started to kind of like change my perception of, you know, medicine and how to treat patients. And by the time I finished high school and I went on to college, I was still on the pre-med track and I started to work in a pharmacy. And while I was there, um, I saw that a lot of patients were basically coming in, getting the same medications month after month after month and doing that for prolonged periods of time. And no one was getting off the medications. And I thought that was really, really interesting and a little bit disheartening at the same time. So over the course of this period, I started to think, you know what, I'm not really sure I wanna go into medicine anymore because I don't think I agree with the structure because I thought you would go to the doctor, have a medicine, get better, and then not be on that medicine anymore and actually get health. So I um, decided after I uh, graduated college to move to San Francisco and I thought, you know what, I'll figure out what I want to do there. And, and if I do end up going to medicine, uh, you know, to medical school, I'll have residency at the, uh, for California and I can go to one of the California schools because I loved San Francisco at the time. And while I was there, I started working in another pharmacy just to get myself on my feet, but then uh, answered an ad for a chiropractor. And he said, I'm looking for someone to come in and just help with like front and and back office duties. And while I was there, it was so amazing because patients would come in like literally crawling on their hands and knees and they would get some treatments and they would stand up, walk out. Everyone had a smile on their face. They were so happy to come. They were always feeling so much better. And this doctor was using nutrition. He was using homeopathics, which I didn't know what they were at the time. He was using supplementation and just kind of like this really well-rounded approach, talking about how you really kind of use your uh, body's uh, natural healing abilities to heal themselves with some of the manipulation. And I thought, this is what I really need to look into. But I didn't want to be a chiropractor. I was like, I, there, this isn't really necessarily for me, but there's got to be some kind of a natural medicine uh, uh, you know, doctor. And so... I kind of like kept looking and, and in the meantime, I was like, well, maybe what I'll do is I'll um, apply to all these medical schools and um, I'll get into one of them and then I'll finish the program and then look for like some kind of like natural medicine or integrative medicine afterwards. And the year I decided to finally like apply to all these schools, I applied to like over 20 schools and I thought, I'm just going to do this. And um, one by one, I got the rejection letters one by one by one. And it was so interesting because my family was like, oh, we're so sorry, like you must be devastated. And I was like, nope, this is con like convincing me that this is not my path, right? Mm -hmm. This is not where I'm meant to be. And one night I was on the internet and I just literally Googled natural medicine doctor. And I found uh, my alma mater, which was Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine and um, looked at all of their principles and how they treated patients and saw the uh, principles of naturopathic medicine of like treating the whole patient, getting to the root cause, stimulating the body, the body's ability to heal. And I was like, this is it. And like, I remember I was seeing that and I had tears in my eyes because I thought, this is what I've been looking for this whole time. And that's, that's how I found it. Very lucky to stumble upon it one day. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like so many of us have this story. And so um, my listeners have definitely heard a lot of us have our like, this is it moments, right? Like, this is it. Um, yeah. I don't know why. It just feels right, right? Um, and that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, well, so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, let's talk a little bit about homeopathy then, because you said you didn't really know much about homeopathy. So what drew your interest towards homeopathy? So it's so interesting um, because, as I mentioned, I was really in the sciences. I loved molecular biology. I worked in a molecular biology lab when I was in college, and I just loved the research aspects of it. And when I saw all of the uh, types of treatments that we're going to learn about in school, I saw, you know, hydrotherapy, nutrition, acupuncture, and I saw homeopathy. And, and as I said, I didn't know anything about it, and I just did a quick search on it, and it talked about how it's this, you know, 
made from these dilute substances and, and all this kind of stuff. And of course, when you look online for a lot of uh, uh, facts about homeopathy, you see that everyone's like, oh, it's just made up. It's a bunch of BS, like it's not anything. And I thought, well, my science brain at the time was like, yeah, well, I don't want to do that. Like, I want to do something that actually has a little bit of like clout to it, a little bit of scientific research and, and, and based on the principles. And so I just kind of ignored it. And I started the school program and our homeopathy classes didn't start until the end of the third year. And I was really enjoying the, the herbal medicine, the acupuncture. And I thought that's where I was going to focus, was going to be doing, you know, acupuncture and then just herbs. And um, one of my upperclassmen friends pulled me aside one day and she was like, listen, there's this homeopathy rotation at school and people are getting better on it and you need to check this out. Like it was totally on the down low, which I thought was really, really interesting because it was like, it was like the secret thing. And they were like, you should sit in on the ship and you should check it out because people are getting better. And I thought, okay, well, I don't really have anything to lose. I'll check it out. And I remember I went to shift and it was so popular at the time that there was like 22 of us packed into this little room because at the time at SCNM, if you wanted to join shift and volunteer and come every week and just be dedicated, you could do that. You didn't have to be assigned on the shift. So there was a ton of people packed into this little room. And I remember like looking around and seeing that there was kind of this system to it. And the first patient, I remember uh, the students came back to report and they were just buzzing, like their faces were lit up and they were so excited. And they said, all right, we have, you know, a, a case of a woman who has about 30 years of depression. She's been on every antidepressant that you can name. She's been in so many different types of therapy and nothing has touched. And it was her first follow-up. It was the first time that she had taken three weeks worth of a homeopathic remedy called NatMer. And mm -hmm. I think it was just a really low potency. It was a 30C potency. And the student said, basically, she said that her depression's gone. She was like, she's had this for 30 years and it's gone after three weeks. And she said, I can't believe it. I'm just so grateful for what you've done for me. I feel more like myself. I feel like the old me from 30 years ago, 30 years ago is back. And I'm just so grateful. And she was like crying happy tears on the ship. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, like that's really significant. And she hadn't done anything else in these three weeks. It was just a homeopathic remedy. And I that thought, was going to okay. be my next question because I was like, I know yeah. people are going to wonder, like, has, did she do anything else? No, it was nothing else. She changed. There were no other variables that were introduced. Basically, she had kept on the same medication that she'd been on for, I think, about like six months or so, which hadn't really done anything. She hadn't changed her diet. She hadn't started taking any supplements. And it was like, she noticed within wow. the first week or so that these changes were happening. And I thought, okay, I got to stick around for this and I got to check this out. And I tell you that quarter that I sat in, it was just story after story of improvements, like really, really profound improvements with homeopathy. And I was hooked after that. I was hooked. And I just knew that this is exactly what I wanted in terms of you know, what we talked about earlier, really being able to like treat that root cause, you know, getting the body to like stimulate itself to heal, you know, taking the whole person into consideration because that's what homeopathy does. It takes into, into consideration your physical, your mind, your body, your spirit, everything together and getting people better and making it be sustainable as well, where it's not something that, oh, if I stop taking the remedy, I'm just going to go back to how I was. And so I was hooked. It was done after that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel like when you hear these stories, it's like you said, it's such a profound experience to even just listen to these stories. And then whenever you experience it yourself, that's a whole nother thing, right? Um, for me personally, I remember, um, I think we started studying homeopathy second year uh, mm. of medical school. And I remember I was visiting my sister in Florida and I had this like intense, like neck pain that I got. And, um, my sister had ibuprofen. So I took that. It helped a little bit, but it was like a nine out of 10, like 9.5 out of 10 pain. Like I was in severe pain and that, that brought it down to maybe like an eight. It really didn't do much. And mm -hmm. in the meantime, I was like, okay, um, if I go to the emergency room, I think they're just going to give me more painkillers. Like, what are they going to do really? I don't know what it is. And so, um, I was like, okay, like in the meantime, while my pain's a little bit lower, 
let me go to the store and I got Arnica, uh, homeopathic Arnica. And I took it after, so after a few hours, yeah, this is the story. After a few hours of the pain um, or the ibuprofen, it obviously didn't work anymore. Um, and the pain was just like 9.5, 10 out of 10 sort of pain again. And um, so then I took the homeopathy then. And within like, th within 30 minutes, like probably 20 minutes, um, my pain went from that 9.5 to like a two. And then I took wow. another dose and it was just gone. And I was like, what is this magic? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> I remember just feeling that too, because I was in your class and I was like, you know, like I'll stay open. I don't know, but like, I'll stay open and I'll try it. Um, and mm -hmm. I was like, I'm a believer. I'm in. <laughs> Sign me up. That's the key. And, and I think that's one of the biggest things that I try to tell students or just to try uh, to tell patients is doing exactly what you did, which is the next time you sprain something or maybe hit a part of your body and you get a bruise and you got that sore pain and it's black and blue, the easiest thing you can do is take some Arnica. And when you see that kind of the tenderness and some of the uh, improvements of how fastly the bruise resolves, that's your own personal testimony. And like when you see it with your own eyes and you have that personal experience, it just adds so much more to the value of you saying, okay, if this works for me, then this can definitely work for other people and in so many other different realms as well. So that's so, so important to have that key kind of personal experience. And it yeah. feels like magic, doesn't it? It's it like really literally the magic pills I just took. <laughs> yeah, it really, really does. And I'm just like, all right, so let's talk about how it's not necessarily magic. <laughs> so, um, so what, what exactly is homeopathy and and how does it work? <laughs> okay, very good. Yeah, so um, one of the things that I really wanted to devote a lot of kind of what I do, not only as an educator, but also as a homeopath, is to, to part of this education piece of um, homeopathy and how it is a very credible scientific modality. And what we're seeing, you know, if we talk about what homeopathy is, we can start with the basics, right? So homeopathy is essentially a Greek term that means like cures like. And so what that means is, is ultimately that if you have a substance, so let's say like a mineral or an herb, and if you take it in a crude dose, like a really large, almost toxic dose, you're going to have some negative effects from that, right? You're going to have some toxic side effects. But if you get that same herb or that same mineral and you dilute it down many, many times, it can actually end up curing those same toxic effects you get in a crude or toxic dose you can actually cure it with a very, very small dose. And so that's what the light cures like means, is that when you have a patient coming in with a particular set of symptoms, we can find a homeopathic remedy that's individualized for a person with their experience of those symptoms, match it to that, and then have it be kind of a nice sort of like curative reaction. So the example I like to use for most people is um, coffee, right? When we drink too much coffee, which we like to do, right? It keeps us energized. We start to feel, you know, our mind is really clear. Our brain is like, we're thinking, right? Everything is clear. Everything is fast. Like we're able to get uh, tasks taken care of. We might, if we drink a little bit too much, we might feel that lightning sensation, you know, in our veins. We feel like we're buzzing a little bit. Now, if someone were to come in to me who doesn't drink coffee, who doesn't uh, drink any caffeine or anything of the sort, and they say, Doc, I've been dealing with this horrible insomnia. And I say, well, tell me about your insomnia. And they say, well, I just, I'm like, my mind is so active. It's buzzing. Like, I can't shut all these thoughts off. They're just racing, racing, racing. I feel like my, my body is buzzing. I feel like I have lightning running through my veins. Well, it sounds like they've almost overdosed on coffee, right? Mm -hmm. So when we look at their picture, it looks like the picture of coffee. So we give them a diluted form of coffee. So we diluted it down about hundreds, sometimes thousands of times so that there's no original amount of the coffee left in the uh, uh, solution. And if we give that to the patient, then that basically cures their insomnia. But if we get to this point of a solution, this is where the big proponents against homeopathy, they'll say, well, you just said there's nothing left in the original solution, right? If there's no coffee left, isn't it just water? Isn't it just an alcoholic solution? Isn't this just a placebo effect? What we're finding in the last 10 years is that even though there's no actual molecules of coffee left, 
there are nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles are part of the original substance that you're making the dilution out of. And they persist. And these have been uh, verified through so many different scientific experiments using lots of different expensive types of equipment that they can detect these really, really small particles. And it's thought that these small particles are what actually act on our body to trigger the healing mechanism so that they actually start to get better. So in effect, homeopathy is turning out to be a kind of nanomedicine. And I know this is a really hot topic in medicine today of being able to try to find ways to give medications in smaller doses and maybe using these kind of minuscule doses to get the same effect, but without all the toxic side effects. So in a way, like a lot of conventional medicine is kind of catching up with what we've been doing with homeopathy for over 200 years now mm -hmm. of just using a small, simple dose to be able to get your body to make those changes and correct the imbalances without having to have any of the negative side effects. So that's kind of essentially how it works and what we're seeing scientifically, um, how it's working on the body in that way. Definitely. And I had two things with that. Like one of the things that I appreciate that um, you mentioned and that homeopathy does approach a more individualized approach, right? So like just when like you, the example, using the example that you gave with insomnia, if in a conventional model, someone came in with insomnia, they're getting Ambien no matter what, right? Um, right, right. But in homeopathy, someone might get that coffee crudum, whereas someone might get something completely different. And, um, and, and that goes based on what they're presenting with what their insomnia looks like, because my insomnia would be different from yours and fully individualizing that. And that's what I love about homeopathy. It's so fun. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's the thing that people don't realize about um, homeopathy and why it can be so powerful. And as you mentioned, with conventional medicine, it's a very one size fits all picture. And that's what I witnessed with my mom as she was going to different doctors she would come in with you know these ailments and they would give her the standard of care versus you know everyone is going to experience their illnesses and that are different from the next person it doesn't mean that they're not going to have the same common symptoms right you know like for example if someone comes in with the common cold they'll likely have a sore throat they might have a fever they might have a cough right those are all going to be the same amongst everybody but how the nature of their sore throat is. Does it feel like it's a burning sore throat? Does it feel like someone is like sticking a knife in your tonsils when you're swallowing? Is your cough dry? Is it wet? Are you noticing that you're chillier since you got sick? Or maybe you're hot and you wanna drink, you know, uh, cold drinks all the time. Those are the things that are really important to focus on for the homeopathy. And that's how we get that individualized prescription so that we can then stimulate the body's own ability to heal itself by giving it the tools to be able to do that. It's almost like working like a signal, right? Because our bodies are very adept at healing themselves. You know, if you cut your finger uh, on a piece of paper, it stings and it hurts. And you're like, gosh, that really, that's a little tough, right? It, it's painful. But if you don't do anything about it, which most people do, they ignore it. In a couple of days, you look back on your finger and you see the cuts gone, right? That's our own self-healing mechanisms that are able to kick in and take care of that. And normally a healthy person, a healthy, uh, uh, you know, kind of what we call these, right? The natural healing uh, abilities of, of uh, the body, that's able to do that for everything. But sometimes it's not able to, maybe due to the type of food the patient's eating, maybe the patient's not getting enough rest or exercise, or something's happened that they're not able to incorrect, you know, correct those imbalances. So the remedy comes in like a very gentle signal and just says, hey, guess what? There's this thing, this chronic disease that you've been dealing with. It's time to take care of that now. And it's like, it acts like a catalyst so that the body then wakes up and says, oh, right, okay, let's do this. And it sets those healing mechanisms in motion. So the remedy doesn't do the healing. And that's one thing that I think is really important for people to know. It just stimulates your body to get healing under control. And I think that's what makes it even more powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a really good point that you bring up. Like it's not the remedy that does the healing. It's your body, but the remedy helps support your body to, to get that healing mechanism going. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, would you say, so like we talked about how, you know, using this very small doses uh, of the med, uh, now they're starting to use like small doses of medications as well. So would you say this is 
kind of similar to like a vaccine effect as well? Yeah, it can be similar. Yeah. Um, you know, this, the, the concept of homeopathy is sort of like changes into what we call isopathy, which is where you actually use the, the agent that causes the illness in a small dose and you give mm -hmm. that to the body and then it's able to create an immune response based on that. So that turns into a concept called isopathy. Okay. And in that, in that way, that's when you can see like vaccines is very similar. Or, you know, I like to think of another concept that is similar to that, which is people who do um, what's called slit therapy, which is for allergies, where they mm -hmm. take these kind of like diluted forms of um, the things that they're allergic to. So it's usually the environmental stuff. So like ragweeds, pollens, grasses, mm -hmm. and they do something that looks very similar to homeopathy, which is where they dilute it down so that it's just a small exposure that you're giving your body, you put these drops in your mouth, and then it kind of tunes and conditions your immune system to recognize it and not have such a bad allergic re uh, response to it. So it starts to uh, not see it as a foreign object anymore. And so people who do this kind of like, it's called sublingual, I think, immunotherapy, mm -hmm. over time, they start to notice that their allergies get better because that huge immune response isn't stimulated because their body's just getting used to having that in the system. So homeopathy can be similar to that. And there are some uh, people who practice isopathy where let's say, oh, you know, let's say you have a um, yeast overgrowth in the gut that's due to candida. Some uh, docs will use actual homeopathic remedy made out of candida, give it to the patient. And in some cases that can help a lot of patients. But I'd say probably it's about a 50-50 kind of a thing because okay. what's really powerful is the individualization. So if you can get some of that specific remedy they need based on their symptoms, you can get usually a lot further with that. But it's the same kind of similar concept of the small doses. And what's interesting is I've been seeing that a lot of oncologists have started to use lower doses of their chemotherapeutics and also they're dosing them in a little bit of like a pulsed manner. So like, you know, take a dose today, take a dose maybe like next week. And so that way it's minimizing their side effects so that you're not getting these global issues uh, all the way around, which is really, really effective too. So it's interesting to see the similarities between kind of the conventional world and homeopathy as we go through and do more research and look at really what's best for the patient. Definitely. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so um, so you talked about like how it's how it works and how we kind of create these remedies and uh, all that. But how would you say? So I feel like a lot of people are always asking about the research, right? So um, what and what I always explain is that research is very differently conducted with um, any sort of natural medicine, really, versus pharmaceuticals. But in for a specific for, for specifically talking about homeopathy, how would you say the research would be conducted differently for homeopathy versus conventional pharmaceuticals? Great. So one thing that is a big um, issue that I'm seeing, which is when a lot of people will look in our most kind of common areas or <clears throat> uh, search engines for homeopathic research, a lot of the studies that come back say, homeopathy is pretty ineffective. We did this research study and it looks like it doesn't work. And that's kind of one of the, the big messages that's being spread is that, you know, we put it to the test and it doesn't seem it measures up to either conventional medicine or just anything beyond placebo. But the issue that we have here that you've brought up, which is that the way homeop homeopathic research needs to be conducted needs to be done through very, very stringent terms. Number one, if there are people who are doing homeopathic studies want to evaluate um, a dilution, it's very important that the dilution be made according to kind of the strict way that Samuel Hahnemann, who's kind of the founder of this you know, system of medicine called homeopathy, it's very important that uh, the homeopathic dilutions are made according to the way that he uh, mentioned, which is it's not just about I'm going to take one part of a solution and add it to another part of alcohol and keep diluting it. But between each dilution, there has to be something called succussion, which is that the dilution needs to be vigorously shaken or struck or just kind of agitated. And that is because what we're finding uh, research-wise is that there is some kind of a reaction that happens between the glass vial and the silica in the vial, 
along with the remaining kind of nanoparticles, there's something that happens with that and its interactions with the water or the alcohol solution that then kind of uh, keep or preserve the uh, ability, the healing ability of the remedy. So this succussion has to happen in between each dilution. And a lot of times when people want to do, you know, a homeopathic remedy and do a research study on it, that's not, uh, that doesn't happen. And if that doesn't happen, the remedy is not going to work in a diluted form. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that what we call the gold standard among research studies is the double blind placebo controlled trial right means that no one has any idea you know if they're an investigator they don't know if they're giving a medicine or a placebo to the patient the patient doesn't even know so it's trying to reduce any chance of bias uh, in the study so that we take out that variable the issue with this is oftentimes is that it'll be done for a particular subject. So if we go back to insomnia, right? They're gonna say, we wanna see if this remedy, let's say the remedy is phosphorus. We wanna see if phosphorus is as good as Ambien for a patient's insomnia. But again, we have the issue of trying to apply a one size fits all um, uh, ideology to homeopathy, which is, not all patients with insomnia are gonna require phosphorus. Some are gonna need cafe accruta, some might need nux vomica, some might need sulfur, right? It all depends on the presentation mm -hmm. of their symptoms. And so by trying to apply and see, you know, is this remedy gonna be as good as placebo or as good as a medication, it's always gonna fall short because we're not individualizing. So this is kind of the issues that we see. So what I've seen in terms of very good high quality homeopathic studies is that what they will do is they will have a, a team of homeopathic practitioners come in and they will, if they want to investigate insomnia or depression uh, and its effects with homeopathy, they will prescribe individualized homeopathic remedies for all the people in the study. And then that way we can get a conclusive idea that homeopathy as a whole is really effective uh, you know, against either conventional medicine or just on its own as placebo. And we have hundreds, if not thousands of studies really talking about this and, you know, showing the power of that individual use. Or oftentimes there will be some good studies talking about combination remedies. So mm -hmm. combination remedies you can buy over the counter at the store. And oftentimes, if any of you can go out in the store, you'll see there'll be these things for common issues like common cold, uh, gas and bloating. You know, there's going to be combination remedies for like pain and inflammation or injury. And those are very, very low potency. They're X potencies. And the reason that they work for most people is that we're going to put together the most common remedies for this condition all into one. So it's kind of like a shotgun approach. So it, if you really need, for example, phosphorus for your insomnia and the combination product has phosphorus in it, you're going to get some improvement from this product and it may, you may not need any of the other remedies in it. So these combination remedies, they will also use with research against um, a placebo or some kind of conventional med and uh, we'll see that there's some good improvements there as well. So as long as we do it kind of in a way that we can still uh, have access to a lot of people's experiences with homeopathy and giving them the right remedy, we can see those changes. So we have to have look at kind of this different lens with how we do research with homeopathy in that way. Definitely. And I think in general, that model is very reductionist and can be very helpful in so many ways, but there, there are other ways of conducting research that I think we need to continue to explore um, outside of just that one model of research. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's the key is that because that's now seen as the double, you know, like this gold standard, people are forgetting that there are other types of scientific research that are just as well, such as case reports, case mm -hmm. studies, you know, observational trials, prospective trials, or just even, you know, basic empiricism that they have validity and maybe they don't have that, but we have so many, uh, you know, recorded cases over the last 200 years of patients getting better that it's just kind of like meshing the two together. And I think that's a really, really great point to not ignore those other forms of equally valid and, you know, research types of trials. Definitely, definitely. Okay, so we kind of touched on this um, where we talked a little bit about some of the misconceptions of 
homeopathy where like we talked about the research and then um, the placebo effect. Are there any other misconceptions of homeopathy that you feel like people should know about um, and like you can help dispel those myths? I think those are the big ones, right? Everyone is like, oh, it's placebo or, you know, it's just water and like water has no memory, right? You know, kind of all these concepts that always everyone, you know, makes fun of homeopathy or, you know, the fact that it seems like this woo woo medicine where we're seeing so many effects, like even this concept that we've talked about where like things in really high doses can cause, you know, negative effects or harm versus in small doses can actually be beneficial. And this is a scientific concept called hormesis that we're getting to know and understand a little bit more about of, of how, you know, homeopathy kind of works into that. I think those are really the big ones. I'd say the other one is within homeopathy itself, there is this concept, I think, of what's called a constitutional remedy, which is like, mm. if you go to a homeopathic practitioner, if they find this constitutional remedy, which is apparently the remedy that you're born with, like if you're born a certain way and you fit the attributes of a particular remedy. And some people will say that if I just take this homeopathic remedy at any phase in my life, whether I'm ill or well, it's going to like cure everything. And we know that to kind of not be the case, right? A lot of people will endure a lot of different things in their life, whether it's trauma, illnesses, grief, loss, or other kind of illnesses secondary to, you know, lack of those determinants of health, not, you know, not enough sunshine, not enough uh, good nutrition, or not enough exercise, all those things. And as a result, who you are as a person, you I'll hear a lot of people say like, well, this person looks like, you know, they have a phosphorus personality, so I'm going to give them phosphorus. But who they are as a person when they're well has nothing to do with who they are when they're ill. In most cases, you know, that person who's so very nice and, and wonderful when they're ill can, can become really angry and mean and irritable. And they're going to need a remedy that, you know, represents this dysfunction, that individual expression. And so this concept of like, if I just give this silver bullet um, to a patient, you know, based on what they need from when they were, you know, born, it's going to cure everything. It doesn't work most of the time because sometimes things will happen. Maybe you'll have a big shock in your life. You'll be dealing with PTSD. You'll need a completely different remedy based on those PTSD symptoms that are going to have nothing to do with who you are as a person, uh, of, of, you know, who you are when you are healthy or when you were young, for example. So I think that's another big uh, thing that I like to kind of talk about because um, a lot of people will go and they will ask for this constitutional remedy. And then if they don't get the results, you know, they blame the homeopathy not working as opposed to it not being practiced the best way. And I think that's the key is that when homeopathy doesn't work, it's rarely because the whole modality doesn't work. It's because it wasn't actually uh, given out or prescribed based on these kind of very strict you know, the scientific method and the system that Samuel Hahnemann put together. And that's really key. That's why it gets a bad rap, I think. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's, that's so helpful. I feel like for, for me, for our listeners, um, because yeah, there are so many common misconceptions and we hear it on like the media and stuff. People are always mocking homeopathy. Um, so, so it's good to understand where that's really coming from. And, um, and I, I feel like in my practice and in general, um, one of our supervisors in med medical school said to always be an open-minded skeptic. And like, that's like something that's always stuck with me. It's just like, okay, I'll, I'll question everything, but I'm going to stay open to everything as well. I'm never going to close myself mm -hmm. off. And, um, and I, I encourage the listeners to do the same um, because that's really the only way we can't close ourselves off to anything, but also don't be fully gullible and just fall for anything. Um, so there, there's a, there's a method to the madness of homeopathy. And, um, I think you've helped us understand it so much better. So I appreciate it. Definitely. I mean, I had no choice. Like I said, I came from a science background and after a while I was like, this is great. It works, but what's it doing? I really needed to understand like, how is this working on like a physiological basis? And thankfully there's enough studies out there that talk about it. So, uh, as you said, like make up your own mind, don't listen to me and don't take my word for it. Go out, do your research and even try it on yourself. Cause I think that is, as we said, the most powerful experience. It 
it definitely is. Um, okay, so before we move on to the rapid fire questions, do you have anything else that you would like to add that we, um, we missed or any other resources that you would recommend for the listeners? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think we talked a lot about like how homeopathy is really good for insomnia, but I want to really impress on everybody that it is really effective for a whole host of conditions from head to toe, whether it's acute or chronic stuff, right? We have great, great uh, uh, research and also just a good track record for acute diseases. So flus, colds, you know, urinary tract infections, headaches, migraines, along with chronic things like digestive disturbances, neurological issues like MS, uh, Parkinson's. Uh, it's also a very good adjunct of treatment for some types of cancers. I mean, you name it, homeopathy is really, really good for it and is very effective. You just need to make sure you find a, a well-experienced uh, practitioner who's able to kind of take all of your symptoms into consideration and provide a good treatment plan for you. So it treats many things from head to toe. I would say if listeners want more and you want to understand a little bit more about homeopathy, there are a few good resources that I would suggest. One of them is the National Center for Homeopathy. They uh, have a website, you can check them out. Um, I'm not sure what is off the top of my head, but if you just look up National Center for Homeopathy, they are the premier kind of uh, North American uh, organization dedicated to homeopathy. You can find practitioners there, you can learn more about homeopathy, the efforts that we have currently underway to preserve homeopathy as um, a medicine under the FDA, because there are, some things that are happening now that are potentially compromising homeopathy being available to citizens of the United States. So you can learn more about that and uh, Americans for Homeopathy Choice, uh, which are associated with them. Uh, to just kind of quickly touch on that, the FDA and um, homeopathy have had a very good kind of symbiotic relationship for over a hundred years and they're reviewing whether the need they need to regulate homeopathic remedies and with some of the uh, stipulations they put into place, they're trying to potentially remove the ability of homeopathic remedies to be sold and purchased or even imported into the United States. So this is taking away a big uh, choice uh, from a lot of consumers who have known to uh, really love and rely on homeopathic medicine. So you can get more information on what's happening there and sign the very many petitions or get involved if homeopathy speaks to you and you wanna to preserve to it through Americans for Homeopathy Choice. I would say those would be probably the best resources there uh, as well. And of course, if you want more information on homeopathy as well, you can check out my website too, which is drvasighi.com, V-A-S-S-I-G-H-I.com. You can find me or you can head on over to Bastyr University Clinic in San Diego and you'll see me there with some links as well. So anything to help continue to spread uh, the love for homeopathy, I'm all about it. Yes, definitely. And we do really, I appreciate you talking about the legislation um, side of things or legal side of things, because we definitely do need to preserve that um, because so many people benefit from it, including myself and a lot of my patients too. So, um, so we need to make sure that we can preserve this medicine for, for our citizens, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So getting into the rapid fire question. So um, they're called rapid fire because they're quicker than the other questions, but you don't have to answer them rapidly. Take your sure. time. <laughs> so the first question I have for you is what does Mahan Health mean to you? So Mahan Health, if we look at the concept of it being great health, and I got to look at this through the lens as a homeopath, which is great health means being able to like be who you're meant to be in this life. Great health means being able to pursue everything of your passions, of who you want to be, to, to make you kind of like the best human that you can be. So that's what I would say. And I think having the ability and those tools at your, uh, at your fingertips to get you to that place so that you can do that freely and you can do that without feeling, you know, dis-ease or any of the symptoms I think that's the best thing because that is what makes, I think, the world and humanity great, which is when we can pursue our best selves. Yes, I love that. Oh, that's so beautiful. Um, okay, so my next two questions, they could be related. They don't have to be, um, but it's completely up to you. So the first question is, what was the most difficult health change for you to make? And then the second is, what are you still working on? Oh my gosh. 
That's so great. Um, I think the biggest change, and I know you and I were sort of talking about this briefly earlier, um, is learning when to slow down. I think that has been the big key. I think all of us, especially practitioners or just really anybody, we can get so wrapped up in all of our responsibilities of what we have to do to keep things afloat in our lives, whether mm -hmm. it's to our family, whether it's to our jobs, our careers, you name it. And a lot of times I think what we need in our life can get pushed to the wayside as a result. And so going at that speed of like 90, 100 miles an hour can just, it's just not sustainable. And I think that's been the, the biggest thing that once, thankfully, I will say that the silver lining that's come out of this COVID pandemic is um, having that time to really slow down and recognize that everything does not need to revolve around my career and other responsibilities that I have uh, to it. And then also learning to reinvest some of that time back into myself. That's been invaluable. It's been absolutely an invaluable thing. And as we're starting to get a little bit busier and as things start to return a little bit more to kind of a normal, you know, depending on where you are in the world, um, I noticed that that is something that is easy to slip again. So at, at this point now, because I've had the, the awareness of it and have been able to kind of make that shift, I'm so much more mindful of it. So it's still something I think I deal with, but it's one of those things where I'll just look at a night and instead of saying, gosh, I've got all these things to do to prepare for the next few days, I'll say, you know what, we're taking this night off and we're going to engage in something else that is better for me, whether it's a hobby or just literally taking you know my my brain and shutting it off for the night and not having to do anything related to anything else or exercising or whatever the case is so mm -hmm. i'd say that's kind of a two thing where i i definitely recognized it but i still definitely see myself crossing that line though i'm more aware of it now definitely and i feel like that is so relatable like you said for so many people um uh, and and we were we were talking about it before and how before the covid pandemic everything was just so go, go, go. And, and yeah, like I see as things start to open up, we're seeing how quickly we can get back into that, like that madness. And, um, it is so important to be mindful and aware of when we do need to just slow down, take that, take that night off. And, uh, you know, um, yesterday I was like, you know, I'm really tired. I'm not going to finish my chart notes right now. <laughs> and that was it, right? You know, just allowing yourself and giving yourself that grace, I think is so important. Absolutely. And, and, and I think that the grace is important, but it's also hopefully to a point where it's like, if this doesn't get done ASAP, it's okay. Like okay. nothing's going to happen. I think we hold really high expectations for ourselves as we get older and even just in in the way that the world is right now there's just so much to do so many responsibilities and if you can prioritize to the things that it's not okay if they don't get done versus the ones that they really are okay if you don't okay. that's half the battle right there that's half the battle you got to choose them when you can find them exactly exactly yes thank you for sharing um okay so my last question for you is if you could have a commercial about anything like a psa on health what would it be about and why? Oh my gosh, great question. Obviously it would involve homeopathy, <laughs> but I think, you know what I think beyond that is, one of the things that I love about naturopathic medicine and why I wanna go into this as well um, is empowerment. And I think my PSA to the world, like my health PSA to the world would really just be kind of like a call to arms for people to understand that you are an autonomous being. You are in charge of your life. You are in charge of your health, I should say, even more importantly. And, you know, you can take control of it. You will probably need help because it's not as intuitive for a lot of people as it is for some other people but everyone has that innate ability to do so. So I think being able to provide tools, being able to empower them, to encourage them to seek practitioners who will not only listen to them, but will also engage in like sharing that autonomous decision-making so that the patient and people feel like they have 
a choice and a little control over their health, I think that's really, really key because so many people will just, you know, do as their doctor says with a lot of trust and it may not be the best thing for them. It may not be something that um, is the best fit for them, for example. Mm -hmm. So I think always having that curious mind or finding practitioners who are willing to work with them and do what I love to call shared decision making, I think that sets those, uh, those stepping stones into place where you start to get way more in control about your health and then you realize so much of it is, can be really in your hands. So I think that's what I would talk about. Definitely. Yeah, I love that. I, and, you know, this is something that I, I feel like I say often, but your, um, your doctor or guide through your health journey, right, is more of your guide and not, they're not healing you, you're healing yourself. Absolutely. And, um, and they're just supporting you. And that's why I like that shared, um, shared connection piece, because that really is what it is. And um, yeah, I, I love that message. It's absolutely beautiful. And I asked that question because I could only imagine if all of um, all of the healers out there could get their message out to the whole world versus like having all these um, junk food and pharmaceutical commercials <laughs> all the time. Like what, what would the world look like? You know, right. what would it be like? Oh my goodness. So different. I would hope that it would be so different, but I inherently I think that would be the case. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Maybe one day my goal is to get, get all these, beautiful ideas out <laughs> into the world. You're doing it and you're doing a great job. So you just have to keep it up. You're, you're, you're living that commercial out with your podcast. So as long as you do it and inspire other people to do so little by little, step by step. Definitely. Yes. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I lo absolutely loved having you and it was so good to see you again. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So good to see you and happy to hear that you're doing most excellently. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Thanks. You too. I hope you all enjoyed that episode and now have a slightly better understanding of homeopathy as confusing and amazing as it might be. Um, I did forget to mention that I did have a patient who her anxiety will only get better with homeopathy. So uh, whenever she's having kind of an anxiety attack, her homeopathic remedy that works perfectly for her um, always has been able to help her. So I'm super excited to share that story, but it's worked for millions of other people's. Um, so definitely make sure to talk to your doctor, uh, your naturopathic doctor uh, about homeopathy and maybe try it out yourself. Like Arnica is super simple and easy to find. And so if you're dealing with any sort of acute pains, uh, bruises or anything like that, uh, you can definitely use that. It's an amazing homeopathic remedy. All right. I will have Dr. Uh, sorry. I will have Dr. Vasigi's information in the show notes below. So make sure to check her out, but that's all I got for you all today. Wishing you all Mahan health and I will see you next time.